Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I might even use my microphone. One. Can everyone hear me on this? Yes. Uh, up on the balcony as well? Yes. Great. Thank you all for giving up your time to be here this evening. Uh, I'm Dennis Campbell, the Guardian Health Correspondent. Uh, we have a very, what we think is a very strong panel uh, reflecting our audience, our readership's huge, passionate interest in the NHS, how it is doing now, particularly as our question says how it's going to be in the future. We have Doctor, in order of the, the people you'll be hearing speaking very soon, Dr. Mark Porter, the leader of the British Medical Association, which speaks for doctors. Uh, to my right, Professor Sir Bruce Keogh, the medical director of the NHS in England. Uh, to my left, the Right Honourable Norman Lamb, the Minister of State for Care and Support uh, at the Department of Health. Uh, and to my left, uh, further over, uh, Julia Manning, the Chief Executive of the Think Tank 2020 Health. Uh, you will hear from our panel shortly and also from several NHS professionals here in the front row as well uh, fairly soon. Before we start, I'm just going to, I'm going to ask you to, uh, to bear with me and watch for just under five minutes a, uh, an excerpt from a video that my colleagues in the Guardian uh, multimedia team made in Christmas last year, December 2013, in Queen's Hospital in Romford, which is, I think, short and insightful and engaging and hopefully will set up at least some of what I suspect we're going to be uh, hearing from tonight. Uh, see you in about five minutes. <laughs> Today I'm on the board, all day. Uh, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. It's hard because I know I've got patients that I need to get into cubicles and at the moment I just can't. Why? Because I've got no space. I've got people out in the waiting room, I've got people sat over on chairs that should be on trolleys and I've got ambulances queuing that shouldn't be queuing. So who's doing, who's doing 15? For us as uh, emergency medicine doctors, there are so many things. Top of the list is we want to do the best for all our patients. And then there are targets that we all want to achieve. A&E departments in the UK are expected to meet a four-hour target to see, treat, make a decision and act for every patient. Failure to meet this standard results in what's known as a breach. Last year, Queen's Hospital met their weekly target just twice. The patient population is pretty huge, actually. I think this trust was built for around 90,000. I think we're serving at least 120 to 40,000 at the moment, and I think the population is rising all of the time. Basically, the, the hospital's full to capacity. It's not A&E. These are patients that shouldn't be in A&E. They've been seen, and they've got a decision to admit. Their treatment still carries on. It's just not nice for the patient. Amy, sister, can I help you? Uh, we haven't really got one. I think they're all in recess at a cardiac arrest at the moment. We've delegated all the roles. Someone needs to do the compressions. We need two or three people for compressions. A two-year-old is rushed into the resuscitation unit, unconscious with no pulse. The lack of space is so chronic that a patient still in a critical condition must be moved to create room for this new emergency. Listen up, everyone. Two-year-old male found unresponsive in bed, not breathing, approximately um, half hour ago. It's been a nightmare today. Mm -hmm. No beds, nothing at all. Two minutes, stop, one second, stop. Asystole. He's been in asystole throughout. Con continue CPR, please. And next cycle is adrenaline. So it's not looking good so far. I'm just here to help you. Yeah. You're in hospital. I'm one of the nurses here. Yeah. All right. We don't want to do any bad to you. We just want to help you. Make sure you're all right. All oh, right. That's very considerate of you. Okay. Most of us imagine that A&E deals with stereotypical medical emergencies, but it treats a vast range of patients with problems of all kinds. Have you got children at home? Oh. No, I haven't. You didn't. All no. Right. Would you have a seat for I'll me, Donna? Kill them all. Donna, 
Get him away from people like you, huh? Do we calling the police? Because we don't know what's going on in her home. She's talking about self-arm and arming the others as well with knives. So we don't want to know what was left behind. So and she's quite distressed as well. So we need to make sure everything is fine at home. All right. Yes. Have we got a deal? Yeah. No, we haven't got it. The challenges of seeing a GP, particularly out of hours, combined with long waits to get an appointment, means a &E becomes a catch-all service. You tend to find a lot of people will come here because they see it as a one-stop shop. They can get x-rays done, they can get bloods done, they can't see their GP for four weeks, if not more. It basically is a no-brainer. You can see why people do it. You can't blame the general populace. I've literally just come back from break, so I just need to catch up on the ones that medics have seen. It's gone mad down here now. Right, take first, tell me where we are. So, medical bridge, waiting to be seen. Yep. Any bridge, surgical bridge. Gentleman, 93 years old, with the possibility to go home, but is there any bridge, medical bridge, waiting to be seen. Gentleman, is going to be a bridge, waiting to be seen. What can we do? Nothing. You can't. You can't. So, it's a two year old that they found about 20 minutes past six, and we haven't had any other rhythm other than asystole. Yeah? It's, yeah? Getting it's getting worse. Shaker and his team have been working for nearly an hour trying to save the little boy's life. Check the pupils. Fix it dilated. And there's no respiratory effort, nothing at all. I think we should stop there, okay? Anyone thinks differently? Anyone thinks we need to continue a bit longer? And Thank have, you. Thank you, everyone. It's a flat line, isn't it? No hard signs. I think you've all done very well. I'll speak to the family. I'll let them know. Patients on trolleys. Ambulances queuing outside. That was in December 2013, a few miles from here. Uh, uh, a surprisingly mild winter. The picture across England uh, is m much worse <coughs> in many places. A handful of Hospital trusts only uh, reached their 4 hour any performance target uh, in the week to last Sunday, uh, we, we, we found out last week. Uh, there are clearly, as we all know, immediate, pressing, possibly short term, uh, but certainly urgent pressures on the, uh, on the NHS at the moment. The unprecedented and, and growing need or demand for care has also prompted serious and difficult questions about how sustainable the NHS is. Uh, as what, when I spoke to Bruce Keogh and interviewed him in his office at the end of last week, he described as a unique global system of healthcare. Uh, there's a projected 30 billion gap in NHS England's finances by 2020-21. In simple terms, a gap potentially between the amount of money it will have and the amount of money it will need to meet the demands uh, for, for care and treatment. Uh, Bruce Keogh, I'm sure, will, uh, will tell us about the uh, about NHS England's five-year forward view that came out in, uh, in October. Uh, himself, Simon Stevens, the chief exec, and other key NHS organisations produced it as their sort of blueprint potentially, certainly widely seen as a blueprint to sort of to secure the future of the NHS. Uh, Bruce Keogh, in his, in his uh, interview that ran in today's Guardian, uh, talked about how the NHS model, the way it does things, the way it delivers care, support, services, treatment, is not really fit for purpose. It's outmoded. There are big changes ahead for the NHS. Bruce is keen to see patient, uh, changes in patients' behaviour. Many other people are as well. And politicians, uh, the government represented here tonight, the Liberal Democrat Party as well by Norman Lamb, uh, have got uh, answers, uh, questions and answers as well. Uh, briefly, in terms of our format tonight, you'll hear very little from me. I'm just here to sort of direct proceedings. The first thing I want to flag up quickly before we start is uh, you should all hopefully have had on your, on your chairs a little note about an app that uh, I'm going to ask as many of you as possible to add to your smartphones to enable you to vote in a series of several votes we're going to have. Uh, sort of it's almost as good as being on X Factor, hopefully, uh, uh, during the course of this evening. Key questions that we'll pose and give us a fairly instant answer to give us a a barometer of what you all think. Uh, can anyone tell me if you all got that? Uh, I see Polly Toynbee seems to have a copy of hers. Yes, thank you, Polly. <laughs> yes. What, what about those little donuts? These uh, I, I, only I only got a smartphone a couple of weeks ago myself, so I, I sympathise. I, I, I'm afraid you will be digitally in, unenfranchised for tonight. I'm afraid. I'm, so, I, I, I'm sorry. Put your, put your hand up if that, if that helped. I'm very sorry about that. It's hard, it's hard to cover everybody. 
I do beg your pardon. Can you hold your mic nearer? Yes, thank you for that, I will. Uh, has everyone got that? If I could urge as many people as possible to load that up now, if you, uh, if you can. We're keen to use, we're keen for as much audience interaction as possible. Briefly, in terms of the format, you're going to hear very briefly, succinctly, for only a couple of minutes each, from the four panellists here, then from the, uh, from the several health professionals on the front row, who I'll introduce in a minute. I encourage everyone, please, to, to tweet as much as, you, uh, as much as you are grabbed by. Uh, the hashtag is uh, GuardianLiveNHS. Uh, my colleague Ben Quinn here in the uh, front row to my left is live blogging this uh, on the Guardian website and we're also recording it and we'll be showing the whole, the whole of this evening's, this evening's proceedings unedited on our website from tomorrow. So you're all very welcome. I am going to ask uh, Mark Porter please to kick us off and we will be, I'll be enforcing this Mark with the audience and all the other panels. Everyone will be as succinct as possible because I sense that there'll be a lot of people wanting to ask questions and want to make this as meaningful as possible. Mark, you're very welcome. Thank you, Dennis, and uh, good evening, everybody. And may I say how grateful I am that the smartphone apps you're all busily installing at the moment don't allow you to actually pitch me off the panel, here, as in X Factor style. Two minutes on the future of the NHS, or indeed, is there a future? It's, it's, it's almost too wide to encompass, but there are a few things that I think it's worth bearing in mind. One of them is that there is no civilised nation on this planet that doesn't make some form of health and social care provision for its people out of public spending. The question, of course, is how much and how. It's also worth noting that there's a lot of debate at the moment about whether we can afford a health service, whether we'll be able to afford it in the future. And I think we should cast our minds back and remember that the National Health Service was established in a stunning act of social solidarity, immediately following the worst and most expensive, and that's worth remembering, most expensive war this country had ever been involved in. When public debt was at record highs, we came together as a people, to be more accurate, my grandparents came together as a people, and decided to set up a national health service and to make that the priority of investment in the health of the future rather than waiting to pay off the deficit first and suddenly the political points start tumbling out. Because that, of course, is one of the things that I think, and doctors in this country think, on the BMA speaking on behalf of many of those doctors, would say is something that we need to remember, that this, that this spending on the National Health Service is an investment in health that marks us as a civilised nation rather than something that is discretionary and can be afforded if and when the economy gets better. So what's happening at the moment? I think as we look around, what we see is a National Health Service that's had really a couple of major things done to it. One, it's been starved of resources. The resources going into it don't keep up with the rising demand of a growing population, a changing demographic of population, a population with more illnesses, and indeed more expectations of the things that we can do. So typically, 3 to 4% every year is cut out of the budget of the National Health Service in England. And that's one of the reasons why we see the problems we see today. But another, but another reason is that the government has been seen its answer to this in reorganising the NHS from top to bottom to introduce and extend market principles of competition within the NHS, which, as we've seen, are a distraction at best, no answer, and probably dangerous at worst. And it's germane to note, it's absolutely important to note, that they have provided no answer. This Health and Social Care Act 2012, the flag piece legislation of this government, has provided no answer to the problems we see today. And I don't think it says anything about how we can answer those problems in the future. Indeed, we all know, and we'll probably all speak on the panel, about the way that integration is important. And yet, the current legislation defining the NHS promotes competition between bodies rather than integration between them. And I think that those are the two key things we need to address to take the NHS forwards into the future. One is to lose the impetus of marketisation. The other is to fund it properly. And I look forward to the debate we have tonight. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. Bruce Keogh. Thank you. Many of the, the things that I'd like to say will, um, will, will chime with what Mark has said. So I see the NHS as a, an international icon of the British social conscience formed as Mark described. And at that time, it was designed to replace fear with hope. So it's owned by the people. It's funded by everyone, for everyone, irrespective of age, social caste, color, or creed. And I put it to you that that principle is as important today as it was then, and it is as important for the future. But the world has changed since the NHS was formed. We now have more older people than we have children. Longevity brings with it 
uh, all the ailments of old age along with frailty. Uh, it requires continuity of care locally. Uh, but the needs and expectations of youngsters are quite different. They want immediacy of information, immediacy of access, and immediacy of treatment. And on top of this, medicine has advanced, and most importantly, it's become much more expensive. And now we find ourselves gripped in a quadruple pincer, really, of increasing cost, increasing demand, rising expectations in a constrained financial climate determined uh, by the consequences of the global financial crisis. And our NHS has coped really well. Other uh, healthcare systems in Western Europe and other parts of the world have ha dealt with this problem by slashing services or cutting the salaries of people that work in them. But we've managed to do neither of those and managed to, to remain true, I think, to the founding values of the NHS. So in the last four years, we've really squeezed the orange on efficiency, but patients and staff are equally feeling the pressure. So we need to find new ways of doing things, or a number of things will happen. In my view, quality could deteriorate, waiting times could elongate, financial deficits begin to emerge, and discussions on restrictions of treatment will become necessary. And Bevan noticed um, in his book, In Place of Fear, that discontent arises from a knowledge of the possible as contrasted with the actual. And we're at risk of that, but that actually doesn't need to be the case. We can manage the demand on the health service uh, by much better prevention. We know prevention is better than cure. We can increase our efficiency through new models of care, the application of new and emerging technologies, and encouraging people to self-care in the way they do in other parts of their life. But be under no illusion, this kind of change will be really difficult. So as the biggest semi-integrated healthcare system in the world, I think we've got a track record of scientific discovery, of innovation, and quite frankly, of addressing some pretty tricky challenges head on. So to my mind, a successful NHS will be based on values, driven by evidence, and focused on outcomes. And any financial debate that we have around the NHS should relate to the value that society puts on the NHS. And that debate should be around values and value. So ultimately, in my view, the real issue is the immeasurable value of living in a society where you, your family, your friends, your neighbors can get access to high quality health care when you're anxious, frightened, or in pain. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Norman Lamb. Uh, well, uh, thanks, Dennis. First of all, I really welcome the fact that The Guardian's initiated this debate because it's absolutely essential that we have it uh, and an honest and open uh, debate. And it seems to me that the next five years is complete crunch time for the NHS. Uh, uh, we've got through these five years, and I think, as, uh, as you said, Bruce, it actually performed, the system has performed remarkably well, given that this has been the tightest financial uh, settlement uh, in the history of the NHS, and it has performed. Uh, but why is it so important that we find solutions to get through uh, an extraordinarily challenging uh, period ahead. Uh, well, the Commonwealth Fund uh, l last year identified the NHS as the best performing uh, health system anywhere in the world uh, in terms of equity, in terms of quality, access. These are things that we should cherish and hold dear. We should be very proud uh, of our NHS. But as you've indicated, the financial challenge due to the pressures uh, that Mark talked about is enormous, growing at about 4% a year. Uh, and <coughs> Simon Stevens, in his forward view, talked about a gap of £8 billion by 2020, but that relies on quite heroic assumptions about efficiency savings over the next five years, and it requires really significant change in the way the system works, and I absolutely do not mean uh, top-down reorganisation. I think we've tested that concept to destruction. Uh, <coughs> uh, but it needs change in the model of care. And the, the changes that I want to see, I want to see a shift from repair to prevention, 
It has to be a complete focus of the system to prevent ill health. Employers and others in society have a critical role to play in that, uh, uh, as well as getting the incentives right, rather than incentivizing activity, which is what we do now. We have to shift from a horribly fragmented system to one that is acutely joined up around the needs of the patient. Incidentally, the fragmentation existed long before 2010. We've institutionally separated mental health from physical health, primary care from secondary care, and indeed health care from social care. I want to see a health and care system in a local area completely joined up, a pooled budget for the health and care system. We need to make it much more personal rather than still rather paternalistic. Uh, and we need to ensure that the incentives absolutely focus on outcomes uh, as Bruce said. Now, in terms of the finances, uh, the public has to uh, come to terms with the fact that we have to find ways of paying for this. But I think also we need a process, and it needs to start this year, uh, non-partisan getting all of the parties signed up to finding a way as to how we can achieve that £30 billion pound uh, efficiency saving with, well, with a mixture of tax changes and efficiency savings to ensure that by 2020 the system is not only sustainable but is providing the best possible care for the citizens of this country. I just end with one final point. Uh, I am passionate about mental health. It is constantly disadvantaged in the way that the NHS operates. That uh, discrimination, uh, which is what it is, at the heart of the NHS, has to end. Now, we've started the process by introducing access and waiting time standards in mental health for the first time from April this year, but there's a hell of a long way to go. But the case for investment in mental health, both moral and economic, is overwhelming. Just before we pass on to, uh, to Julie Manning, I'm going to take uh, the chair's liberty and ask Norman, just, could you just clarify one thing, because I don't think I've heard you or anyone from your party or indeed your department say it before. You just mentioned something that maybe sounded like a call for sort of all, all the parties to get, there, to get together in some way to work out how the, the, the famous 30 yeah. billion gap in blood. Do you mean, no. do you mean a, a cross-party working group, a royal commission? What do you, what do you mean? Uh, well, I, I, think, I think you've got to ha find a process. If we just carry on as we are, the NHS will break in the next parliament. And if it's left to partisan politics, one of the disadvantages of a publicly tax-funded system, incidentally, I very, very strongly support it and always will do, but one of the disadvantages is that it is so acutely political that it's very difficult for politicians to have the sort of open debate that you have initiated on The Guardian. And I think you need to find a process to enable people to have the space to engage with the public, to get the public to sort of think about some of the big decisions we have to take. Uh, and, uh, I mean, interestingly, Canada did this back in the 90s when they had a very tough budget uh, situation. But the gap between the understanding of the sort of experts and where the public is at in terms of the challenge that lies ahead is quite large. And somehow we've got to engage with the public, both nationally and locally, about the big decisions we have to take in order to sustain the system. Thank you, Norman. Julie Manning, please. Thank you very much, Dennis. Um, thank you for the invitation to come here this evening. I just want to give you a bit of context. Uh, context. Uh, you can have my contacts as well. Um, for where I'm coming from, I, I spent 19 years working in the NHS as an optician, and the last third of that was working with people who are housebound, often end of life, eye care, many of whom had diabetes and were in danger of losing their eyesight. I also worked with prisoners sectioned under the Mental Health Act for whom there was no statutory provision provision for eye care and it's because of what I saw and the experiences of the people that, and the ladies and, and the gentlemen that I worked with that uh, uh, propelled me into wanting to be involved in the wider thinking about the future of the NHS because I saw heartbreaking situations of social care being withdrawn and people being left completely isolated. I saw virtual neglect of, uh, of uh, disease which, because people couldn't get out and GPs weren't going out to see people, um, was, was again uh, you know, shortening lives when it really shouldn't have been. And lack of community care and real jobs worth mentality amongst some people visiting homes and only doing specifically what they've been told to do or de designated to do and not making that 
that cup of tea, not doing anything extra. And then the other half um, of, of that motivation is, is my other half, who works in a comprehensive in one of the inner, inner city uh, boroughs in London. And he, um, his school is not one of the worst case scenarios, but it's, it's tough. 85% of the children come from non-stable backgrounds. And the largest group, as we heard from the DWP last year, the largest group of people who are now claiming uh, work, uh, we've gone through the work capability assessment and, and are claiming employment support allowance are 16 to 24 year olds because of mental health issues. And that is just that staggering, it is appalling. These are people who aren't even expected to, not, let alone look for work, but even be taught how to fill out a CV and apply because they are in such a state that they cannot, uh, they're not considered even capable of that. So that's a little bit of context of where I'm coming from. The question was, is there a future for the NHS? And the answer is yes, but it's not for the faint-hearted. For many of the reasons that we've already heard already, there are you know, financial pressures which are really significant. We hear a lot about the deficit, but actually our balance of payments is one of the worst that we've ever had in our history. The tax situation, we've heard calls for more tax, but with our ageing population, the ratio of people in work to those over 70 is, is going down. So by... 2030, there'll be a third less people paying tax and working than we have now, and we'll still be asking for the same support for public services from those taxpayers and supporting the over 70s. So, um, real, you know, so raising taxes, you know, we might be able to do that short term, but long term, that's not a solution. The design and culture, we've already heard, you know, we, we need a fundamental change in the way that we, we deliver services, because they, they were designed for the 1940s and 50s, and really not enough has changed. We have not adopted a lot of the digital technology that is out there, which could really transform our individual experience of health, and should be transforming the way that professionals are dealing with us, seeing us as participants, and people who could be involved in our health, who should be more informed about our health, who uh, should have a greater sense of uh, being interconnected, being able to see all our healthcare records. The software has been there for over 10 years. And how many of you have actually seen your GP record, your hospital record, your social care record? Anyone? One, two, three. Ah, oh, fantastic. A little bit of progress, but you know, considering the IT's been there for so long, it's really not good enough. And I know that it's a coalition promise that that should happen, but you know, if we are going to become more intentional about our health, that really has to be facilitated. And the, um, the last thing I just want to pick up on, again, the word's been used already, around our expectations of what healthcare can deliver and our behaviours. Uh, when it comes to, to fund what we're not doing, and we've talked about it for years, we're not investing in public health. We're not supporting people properly to l make healthier decisions in their day-to-day -day lives. And that, because of that, we've seen widening inequalities, which is inexcusable when we've had all the data, we've had the knowledge, we know what interventions really make a difference, and yet we haven't invested in those. And then just finally on the wider NHS, it cannot go on doing absolutely everything because because of the cost of medical technology. And we need debates like this to talk about what is the NHS there for? What are the priorities that it should have? Because we need to be realistic about the funding and the, the cost of medical technology. We can't do everything. So that's my first pitch. Thank you very much indeed. We're going to try and keep to time tonight, so uh, I'm going to bring in straight away uh, three, what was actually planned, hoped originally to be four uh, NHS professionals on the front row who are going to tell us very briefly about their own experience, pose a question to uh, ideally one, the most relevant person on the panel, and then we're going to uh, throw it wide open. We were meant to be having uh, a, an A&E doctor who was instrumental in, in getting us access to and helping make the, the, the little film we showed you early on, uh, Saleh Hassan, but You'll not be surprised to hear this. She's very busy at work in her NE department and she can't be with us. Pressure, pressure, pressure. Uh, I'm going to ask, first of all, uh, Dr. Zara Aziz, uh, a GP, to talk to us. Then 
Dr. Peter Cotter, the uh, Chief Executive of the Royal College of Nursing, and then Lisa Rodriguez, who until last year was the head of an NHS Mental Health Trust, uh, to talk to us uh, for as succinctly as you can. We will need microphones. Uh, thank you. Uh, Zara, first of all, just tell us briefly uh, how, who you are, what it's like <laughs> at your part of the NHS frontline, and the one question you want one or maximum of two people on this panel to answer. Okay. Thank you. Um, my name is Zara Aziz. I'm a GP in Bristol, and I'm going to talk about um, um, is there a future for the NHS from my perspective um, as a a GP working in a large uh, practice in inner city Bristol. Uh, we have over 15,000 patients. Um, range of demographics, as Dr. Porter has touched on it, um, increasingly um, large elderly population, uh, frailty, old age, lots of housebound patients. Um, so we've seen a rise in patient expectations and a rise in GP consultation rates. Um, there's an increase in the number of um, home visits that we're doing on a daily basis. On an average day, we can have up to 20 visits a day um, for six to seven doctors, which is a huge increase from when I first started around eight years ago as a GP. There's also been a rise in paperwork. Um, We've seen a change in um, the medical problems that we're seeing, so more complex due to early uh, discharges from hospital. Um, also, um, the general population is also presenting more um, for minor ailments, and there is um, less of an inclination for self-care and less use of pharmacies, which we're encouraging at the moment. We're finding that um, there's more work being handed over to us from secondary care, uh, which itself is facing huge pressures um, because they have to cut waiting times and facilitate early discharges. We've had reconfiguration and amalgamation of the local trusts, and what this has meant is that um, GPs are finding it increasingly difficult to um, refer patients to hospital, whether it's for an inpatient admission or for um, a clinic referral. Um, in addition, what we haven't seen is an equivalent um, funding or investment of resources in the community for ourselves and patients so that we're not able to access adequate numbers of district nurses, community matrons or health visitors. What this has meant is that um, because of this unchecked demand in the community, GPs are increasingly working 12-hour days um, and this is having a huge impact and this is just to keep your heads above water. And we're finding that it's affecting patient care, um, this eroding morale, so there's a lot of burnout in the profession, um, and also we're facing a recruitment crisis, which is intensifying. Um, recently, we carried out a recruitment exercise at the practice. We had three GP posts, salaried posts. We offered GP partnerships as well. We had two applicants um, for the three posts, and we employed both of those GPs. I think of, in terms of general practice, it's the bedrock of the NHS, but in its current state, its, its future is uncertain. It's the ethos of care and compassion that we need to encourage and we must keep alive within the NHS. I feel privileged that I work as a GP. We have some amazing doctors, nurses, paramedics, other frontline staff, and working with them, I feel that it's something that we want to keep alive. Everyone seems to soldier on, um, despite working increasingly difficult working environments with very under-resourced conditions. What I want to ask uh, Mr. Lamb is my question that um, currently there's an unmet need in the community where uh, patients who don't need to be in hospital but are admitted because there might be social reasons for admission or not being able to cope in the community and they need intermediate care or they need step-down beds or cottage hospitals, but there's a lack of these services in the community and lack of adequate social care, is whether there are any plans or initiatives by the government to actually fill that gap. And what are his thoughts on that? Can I just check that everyone hear Zara's question to Norman Lamb? Yeah. Everyone up on the balcony in particular, that, that okay? Good, thank you, Norman. Well, it's a very good description of the sort of pressures that you're uh, under, and I hear it from many people, including my sister, who's a GP. Um, and uh, I think you uh, very rightly define where the investment is, is needed. And uh, if you look at the graph of what's happened uh, to spending over the last uh, four or five years, and indeed it's, it, it continues before that as well, uh, income for acute hospitals has continued to go up like that. Uh, the line is quite sharp, actually, in terms of income. 
but income for general practice, for community services and for mental health has gone down uh, to varying degrees. And to me, uh, you, you have to try and work out why this is happening. Uh, and it's about uh, incentives that aren't, just aren't aligned within the system. You've, so we're paying for activity in acute hospitals. So it sucks um, income into hospitals. And then clinical commissioning groups in F every local area, and before them primary care trusts, managing a budget, something has to give. So uh, community services, mental health, which aren't subject to that payment for activity regime, tend to lose out. Uh, and indeed, in the overall, uh, uh, in terms of the overall slice of the cake going to primary care, the same has happened. So. In my vision, which is, which as I described, is about a shift of resource to prevention uh, and to a much more joined up system. And indeed, the forward view that uh, Bruce talked about a little bit, uh, which Simon Stevens has uh, published, talks about different models of care, one of which is uh, a much more joined up, out of hospital uh, care arrangement. I, I think linking up uh, social care support, community support, much more closely to primary care uh, practices makes uh, a, an awful lot of sense. Uh, and I mean, ultimately, my preference is to see the development within the NHS of, in effect, integrated care organisations. Um, uh, so I don't favour the sort of marketisation that Mark warned of at all. I favour a joined up, integrated approach. And indeed, when you look at the evidence of different payment systems, payment by results doesn't deliver good results for patients ultimately, and we've got to move away from it as a matter of priority. No, Norman, <coughs> at such gatherings, whenever a minister is present at any such gatherings, there's always an inevitable degree to which they become a bit of a, a lightning conductor because you are someone, with great, that. You are someone who, is, who is at the moment in, in power. Uh, and perhaps lying behind uh, Zara's question, you might, bearing that in mind, you might uh, uh, agree with me that there's, it's sort of been a major failure of recent policy over recent years, this government and arguably the previous one, to allow the proportion of overall NHS funding going into what Zara rightly says is the front line of the NHS care, many people's entry point to, to, to the NHS, 90% of all patient contacts done by the nation's GPs, a major failure, a major mistake to allow funding for general practice to, to reduce. Would you agree? Well, I think it needs to increase. Uh, that's the way I'd put it. Um, and um, and I, I, I mean, there, are, there can be lots of claims made about the Health and Social Care Act, and Mark makes his case, and, and I respect uh, the position that he uh, puts. I think often the claims on either side of the extremes are, tend to be a bit exaggerated. Uh, I don't think it's uh, made a fundamental difference to the way in which the uh, NHS operates, but I feel that the system is quite dysfunctional. If you look at the, if you look at the big pressure that we face in this century, it's people living with long-term chronic conditions and often a mix of mental health and physical health conditions. Uh, does the system as currently designed, as traditionally designed, serve those people well? No, it doesn't. Uh, and so we need to uh, change it, change the model of care to meet the needs of today's population. And it has to centre around primary care, to be honest. Okay. Thank you, Norman. So we'll pass on, if that's right, just for reasons of time. Peter Carter from Royal College of Nursing, please. Okay, good evening. Um, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting us. Uh, it's a really welcome opportunity to contribute to the debate. And as we've only got two minutes, I'm going to crack on. <laughs> um, you gave me four questions, and I'm very briefly going to answer each one. The first question was, is the NHS's unique model of healthcare under threat? Yes, I believe it is, unless we properly fund it. Uh, over the past few weeks, there's been a flurry of stories about pressures building up in the system, particularly A&E, uh, and the NHS staff are doing a, a commendable job on holding it together. But only yesterday, there was extensive publicity in one of your newspapers about the massive increase in the number of stress-related illnesses, particularly among nurses. The situation cannot continue. The second question was, is a publicly funded NHS sustainable? 
I believe it is. However, we need to see it funded around the European average. What most members of the public don't realise, because they keep hearing from some politicians, with a notable exception of Norman, that this is a bloated NHS, that we cannot continue to pour money into it. The average member of the public doesn't realise that we spend less than most Western European yeah, yeah, countries. Yeah, yeah. France, Germany, Spain, Italy. <laughs> now it's my turn. Um, the Republic of Ireland puts us to shame. And we actually spend a half of what the United States of America spends on it. So we need investment. The third question was, are the political parties uh, in the run-up to the election falling over themselves to make promises about NHS funding? Well, they are, but what we want to see is the detail. And we want to see some triple locked promises so that after the general election, that doesn't begin to fade away. Now, we need more money, but we need more reform. And each panel member in their own way has touched on this. Public health, getting upstream, yeah. looking at lifestyle acquired illnesses is absolutely essential. Otherwise, it's unsustainable. Care of older people, I'm saddened to say, in far too many places, it's absolutely lamentable because it's not properly funded. And Norman, can I make the point that during the coalitions uh, uh, since May 2010, the number of district nurses has dropped dramatically. In 2003, we had 12,000 district nurses. Now, these are the government's figures, not mine. We now have 5,500 district nurses. We've dropped 6,500. The very workforce that not only keep people out of hospital and keep people well, but facilitate discharge. We have over 20,000 people in hospital beds who could be medically discharged, but can't be, because you don't have the workforce there. And the final thing on figures which I want to say, and I'm not sucking up to you for one moment, please believe me and the audience believe me, is this. You, I have commended you publicly on many occasions for the wonderful job you've done in raising awareness about mental illness, mental health. But, and again, this is a government figure, not mine, since May 2010, we have lost 4,000 mental health nurses and 1,500 beds. Now, most of that didn't happen on your watch, but that's the reality. The fourth question was, do we need an NHS tax or should we be charged for visits to GPs? Absolutely not. If we did that, Should we, we would renege. We would renege. No, currently we the the public pay their taxes, and I actually believe the public would be prepared to pay more taxes if they knew <laughs> if they knew the money was being well spent. And whilst we've talked about efficiencies. I would urge whoever wins the next general election to take a serious look at, first of all, the apparatus for the internal market and the contracting mechanism, which detracts from patient care. The second thing that I would apply ourselves to is this idea that competition is going to drive up efficiency and drive down costs. We don't want competition, we want cooperation and we want collaboration. And if we ever moved away from that founding principle of free at the point of delivery, irrespective of the ability to, care, uh, to pay, I believe we would be a lesser na a nation. So my, my question to you, is that there does seem to be currently a lot of political consensus on going forward in relation to Simon Stevens' five-year forward view. How optimistic are you or any other members of the panel that you really could get some political consensus and so we stop this ridiculous point scoring, particularly what we see at Prime Minister's question time, which frankly is destructive and does nothing to enhance the quality of the debate? Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to... No I was directed particularly again to Norman, but I'd like to hear what all the panel have to say very briefly. Julia, do you mind kicking us off? Very briefly, please. 
in response to everything uh, Peter uh, said. Uh, uh, what, what, what Peter was just saying there about what the political agenda should be, the party should come together in the NHS, less it, less it to be used as a political football. Mm. Uh, well, the irony is Briefly, that please. that's partly what Andrew Lansley was trying to do with the Health and Social Care Bill, is actually to try to de depoliticise. But, uh, hang on, hang on, hang on. but politicians, you know, everyone else around him, didn't like, I mean, you know, still want to sort of stick their oar in. Absolutely, we should be diffusing this, depoliticising it. It is something which is far too important to all of us to be this political football. And absolutely, we should have a commission that comes together and actually and it facilitates these kind of discussions so that we can decide what kind of NHS we want, how much we're prepared to pay for it, and you know, agree on the outcomes. Thank yep. you, Julia. Mark Porter. Thank you. Um, I think the National Health Service is inevitably going to remain co a contested political field. <laughs> Why do I think that? Because it's very hard to imagine a world in which one-sixth of public <laughs> expenditure isn't the subject of political debate, yeah. of ministerial intervention, of uh, the fights across the dispatch boxes that so turn us off week by week. And it's very hard to imagine a world in which politicians will pull back from that and say, no problem, we'll, we'll trust you guys to get on with it because you know what you're doing. After all, we've got elected those politicians because they say they think they know what they're doing. And I think within that, though, one of the things, the specific question about the five-year forward view within that is one of the things I think we should note about the five-year forward view, and I'm not necessarily a fan of everything written in it, there's another thing that needs saying, but one of the things we should note is it isn't a prescription. It isn't like the Health and Social Care Act was, which is, this is how it will work, this will be the answer to everything, this will happen everywhere, we will sweep it away and replace it with what we're going to put in its place, and that will resolve the problems, which, of course, we've seen being operated so successfully. But what the five-year forward view does is it considers the future and says there are some options that we need to consider and what fits best in some places may not fit best in others. And I would salute Simon Stevens for saying that. The bit where I'd have a really a bone to pick with the five-year forward view is that many of the, uh, many of the um, assumptions within it, the financial assumptions, are predicated upon efficiency savings that I don't believe will ever be achieved. Those efficiency savings, remember, being applied to a national health service that is already considered by international observers to be the most single most efficient national health service on the face of the planet, mm -hmm. and yet we're to carry on extracting 3 or 4% efficiency from it for the next five years if we're even to get to the £8 billion gap that the political parties are currently squabbling about not promising. So I think we've got real problems there with the acceptance within the five-year forward view and other places that we need to carry on removing funding from the NHS. But I think it is reasonable to look back and say, at least it isn't a top-down prescriptive reorganisation. We should have had enough of those. Please, no more. Bruce, briefly, please. So, firstly, I agree enormously with a lot of what Peter said. I, um, I believe passionately in the future of the NHS. I'm not in favour of having to pay f to go and visit your GP. I think there are two reasons for that. Firstly, it's a thin end of the wedge. What next? Secondly, it discriminates against those people who are less well off. And actually, that runs right against the grain of one of the fundamental principles of our NHS. Now, with respect to the kind of political element in the five-year forward view, what was unique about the five-year forward view is, and for those of you that haven't had a chance to look at it, it's a relatively short document which has been produced by people working in the NHS um, without any political input. So it was presented to political colleagues as a consensus view from people in the NHS about what the way forward is. And in essence, it says that we need to get a lot more serious about prevention, which I think um, we've already started, has already started to emerge from the conversation. Secondly, that we need new ways of doing things, and it lays out a, a couple of examples which we can talk about. And then finally, it says that um, we, we need a significant contribution from, uh, from the taxpayer, uh, but it, to meet that, we need to demonstrate that we are actually being efficient ourselves, because it's not reasonable to go to the taxpayer and say, give us more money, if, um, if we can't prove that we're um, pulling our weight in terms of efficiency. Uh, but what I would say is that external assessment from the Commonwealth Fund has shown not only are we good, but we are 
one of the most efficient Western healthcare services. So we have some objective evidence of that. And in the five-year forward view, we've set ourselves a very tough challenge of, um, of uh, 2 percent annual efficiency savings. Thank you, Bruce. Norman Lamb. Well, just a, a quick comment about the forward view. Uh, I mean, I instinctively and philosophically uh, am very attracted to it. I think it's actually, may I say, a liberal view of the NHS because it moves away from the idea of uh, top-down prescription imposed from Whitehall. Uh, as I said earlier, we've tested that to destruction. And what happens, whoever's responsible for reforms, uh, people have to grudgingly go along with it. But there's no sort of sense that this is change that we own as, as as clinicians or as local leaders and I think uh, this is a remarkable workforce we got here uh, with an extraordinary array of skills and if you unleash that uh, the power of that workforce and enable them to develop the services as they see fit then I think you can achieve remarkable things and that's in a way at the heart of my initiative for integrated care pioneers that we actually say to local areas you get on and do it we will be here trying to remove barriers uh, but uh, it's you that knows your service and how to develop in the best possible way and you will get enormous energy in that way but to directly uh, respond to Peter's uh, challenge is there a way of achieving consensus and getting away from this nightmare of the Wednesday lunchtime uh, shouting match uh, which throws a lot of heat on the subject and very little light um, well, I mean, that's why I've put forward the suggestion of, of a commission, whatever you want to call it. And I think, actually, if people could just for a moment be rational in the lead up to the election, whoever wins, and nobody has the faintest idea who's going to win this election, whoever wins has a stake in avoiding a total disaster for the NHS over the next five years. And I'm offering a way, with all parties signing up now, given that we all have a stake, we could all be involved in government, we have no idea what the outcome will be. Let's all commit now to a process that allows us the space to take those tough decisions, both about the funding levels and about the changes that are necessary to implement the forward view. Norman, <coughs> Norman quickly, which, which of the, the, the two parties, if there was another coalition, which of the two main parties would you most <laughs> like to help, to, to, to work with, to, to safeguard the future of the NHS? You know I'm not going to answer that question. Give us a, uh, give us no, a clue. I'm allowed to uh, ask. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm a liberal, uh, a, a liberal Democrat, and actually very proud of it, despite everything we've been through over the last five years. Uh, and uh, and, and I, I'm also a pluralist. I believe in being prepared to work with other people. Uh, and I actually get on well with uh, the Labour health team. Uh, and I get on well with my colleagues in the Department of Health. So uh, I think you have to make the best of what the public decides uh, in the general election. Is that all right as an evasive answer? That, that's a politician's <laughs> answer, but we'll, we'll let you off. OK, we're running slightly behind time. for the, the last voice from the NHS front line, if you like, is uh, Lisa Rodriguez, uh, the former head of Sussex Partnership Trust and NHS Mental Health Trust. Uh, Lisa, you're very thank welcome. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me as well. My name is Lisa Rodriguez. Um, I started my NHS career in 1973. Um, half of it was spent as a nurse and a health visitor, and then the latter half as a manager, 13 years as a chief executive. I was released into the community last summer, um, and now I'm a writer and a campaigner. Um, I'm also a patient. Um, I first saw a psychiatrist when I was 15, and I've had mental health problems off and on since. And so you wouldn't be surprised that I'm going to ask a question that is related to the announcement yesterday about zero suicide policy. Um, uh, Deputy Prime Minister uh, presented the policy um, and people seem to think it's an interesting idea. Uh, people like me, who sometimes consider suicide, are very concerned about it. And we're concerned about it for a number of reasons. Um, I'm going to pose my question. I know you said to one person, but sorry, it's to all of the panel. They can make a choice about whether they answer it or not. I hope all of them will answer it. I'm not pointing it in the direction of a member of the government on the panel, because um, I don't think that's fair. Um, so it's a laudable aim, but mental health has huge, huge stigma. It starts with stigma that we have within ourselves. Um, that sticker can, can disappear when you're well, but when you're poorly, it comes back, and it comes back big time, sometimes with voices from somebody else, often with your own voice saying you're not worth it. Um, then the stigma is family and friends and people you work with, and then the stigma is society and what society is made up of, which includes 
public services and includes the NHS, NHS staff, but also NHS managers. And the impact of that stigma then is really very bad because as we've been hearing earlier, and I'm really grateful for other people mentioning mental health, we don't spend enough on research. Uh, we don't spend enough on services. The status of services is low. The status of staff is not where it should be. Morale of staff is pretty poor at the moment because people are absolutely up against it. Um, the commissioning decisions are discriminatory. Commissions are often third or fourth in line and don't get to go and speak at the table. Um, so it's physical health versus mental health. Actually, it needs to be all of those things. And Norman, you mentioned reduction in uh, the amount of resources available. It's a real terms reduction, Peter, you also mentioned it too, of around 1% from 12% to 11% of spend. We need to spend about 25% on mental health services because it's about 25% of the disease burden. Um, and that cut in spend on children and young people services has been the most severe over the past five years and yet that's where we've seen the greatest growth in demand so this this stigma has really really serious implications um, I absolutely agree with Sir Bruce that um, we need prevention is better than cure but we don't cut cancer services just because we've reduced smoking and yet mental health commissioners are asked to reduce mental health services if we're going to be providing primary prevention. And, and the one doesn't equate with the other. You don't uh, stop somebody from getting schizophrenia by providing um, well-being classes or mindfulness classes. You might improve their circumstances, but you don't make that reduction. So the worry that those of us who experience mental health services have about this uh, zero suicide policy is that the impact could be that it sends people uh, further and further away from seeking help, it also means that there'll be another stick to beat services with at a time when they're already right up against it. So my question to the panel is, what are you going to do personally about that, each of you? Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Mark Porter, as succinctly as you can, please. It, it's fair to say that I don't organise the NHS. I'm absolutely with you and will argue with that. We argue to that end, and I applaud the government for, it, for its announcement on this. And there's no two ways around it. When the government does something right, it's important to say so. In a sense, we're prisoners of our past on this. We've had mental health services that have been segregated off because hundreds of years ago, we had a silo that was segregated off and we fought for, okay, we haven't bothered to fight for hundreds of years to try to reverse that injustice. And it's absolutely important to recognise that there should be nothing in principle separating out and indeed stigmatising those services. I think one other thing to say, though, is it's important to bear in mind that while it's, a, while it's often said that other services aren't being cut at the moment, for example, cancer services, do you know what? It's been announced only a few weeks ago that they're going to be, because the Specialised Services Commissioning tariff for next year is proposed to be cut to 50% for any activity over and above last year's total. Specialised services mean things like many as cancer services, renal transplant, cardiac, liver, various other services that are currently commissioned outside normal district general hospitals and brought together in, in regional centres. And the proposal is to cut the tariff price for any activity over and above the previous baseline. So I'm absolutely with you in that we, what we need to do is to reverse literally centuries of neglect. In that regard, it predates the health service by a long time. But we shouldn't forget that all parts of the NHS are being actively cut at the present. Bruce, briefly. So, I agree with you. And stigma, and indeed prejudice, are big issues. But stigma is a significant one. If you wind back, if I wind back to when I was younger, and my mother had cancer, nobody was able to talk about it. You know, it was a no-go zone. Mm. And um, we've got over that with cancer. We can get over it with mental health. I support Mark's comment that... Um, Years ago, asylums were built here and hospitals for physical disease were built here. And the end result of that was a feeling that somehow or other in both scientific, clinical and social terms that they were different. Actually, but they weren't. And then the asylums were shut and people were moved out into the community, something we haven't achieved quite so well in physical health. But 
the science has now advanced. And what the science is showing is a much greater relationship between physical health and mental health. And that's bringing clinicians into a place where they're seeing them as the same thing. And that started the process. And one other thing I'd say, there's been a talk about the relationship between politicians and the NHS. And I'd like to just pay Norman huge credit because Norman is on our back the whole time saying, what are you doing for mental health services? So the particular things we're doing are we have now a waiting time target for people who are having psychotic episodes. That's really important. And I've seen uh, problems with uh, someone in my family who just couldn't get help from the NHS. We've started a, f a major focus across the country on liaison psychiatry, and we're focusing on, this, on a really evidence-based um, uh, therapies of, uh, of beha cognitive behavioral therapy. And that's been, I mean, Norman has been tremendously supportive and kept, uh, kept the pressure on there. So I think we've, we're starting to make some progress, but there will be some organic growth in it. It's not something we can solve overnight. Thank you. Julia Manning. I was 22 when I was first told that I was mentally ill and needed to see a psychiatrist. And I went home and I sat in the bath and I sobbed and sobbed and sobbed because my symptoms were extreme fatigue, joint aches, muscle aches. They were all physical symptoms. And no one took the time to explain to me that you know, mental illness has physical symptoms. And, I, and over the years, I've felt more and more that we have this false divide between physical and mental yeah. health. It's actually incredibly harmful separating off mental health because just about every physical condition has a mental component and a lot of mental health illness has physical symptoms and physical manifestations and it's really unhelpful for the individual, for society, for understanding, for destigmatizing, to go on talking about mental illness, although I quite understand there's a transition to get to a point where actually we're talking about something else, and whether that should be neurological or brain or, or whatever it is, it is physical, it's measurable, it is not you know, in your head and something ephemeral. So I am absolutely with you. There is false division. What we're doing is we've got a report coming out on depression in the next couple of months, and we are talking about parity of esteem, we're talking about stigma, and one of the things that we're highlighting is that medicines for uh, for people with mental illness are disincentivized for two reasons. One is that the organization that assesses what medicines should be available to the public, uh, which is nice, um, rarely, and if not ever, actually do a formal assessment and produce a recommendation on medicine for mental illness. So medicines that go to NICE are just given guidance, which means it's optional, which means that no one has to prescribe it. And the other disincentive is that because so few medicines actually come through for mental illness, the difference between the cost of a new medicine and what's already on the market is huge. So you know, it falls through both gaps in terms of a NICE assessment and making it available to the public. So that's one of the things that we're, we're highlighting. And finally, our last piece of work that came out just a couple of weeks ago was around the concept of head of well-being in state schools. And a fundamental component to that is, is picking up on the emotional and mental needs of teenagers and actually coordinating. There's a lot of you know, siloed uh, initiatives in schools about physical health, eating, and PE, and PHSE, and citizenship. You know, we think uh, if there's a strategic approach to wealth, um, to, sorry, well, health and well-being uh, amongst teenagers that we could actually make a lot more progress and, and do some of that preventative and, and supportive uh, work that could be done. Thank you, Julia. Norman. Uh, well, I totally support that idea. Um, three points. First of all, on this great divide between mental health and physical health. We have a situation where people with severe and enduring mental ill health don't have their physical health needs properly looked after, and so consequently they die about 20 years uh, too early, which is a scandal. Uh, and we don't ensure that the mental health needs of people with physical conditions get properly addressed. So, and there's some fantastic work underway with people like Andre Tiley, a psychiatrist in London, who's applying the sort of IAPT psychological therapies to people with heart conditions and getting amazing results. So we need to join the two up together. The second point about the waiting time standards that I've sort of 
pioneered and pushed through and finally secured starting in April. I bumped into Mike Richards uh, recently, who is now the Chief Inspector of Hospitals, but was the cancer czar under the previous government, and he drove through the waiting time standards in cancer care. And he said to me, Norman, the, the introduction of standards, access standards in cancer care, transformed cancer treatment. Uh, it forced the whole system to think af afresh about how people got access, and this, it can do the same for mental health. So uh, I'm very excited by this. It has to be, we have to roll it out across the whole of mental health over the next five years, but I think there's a fantastic opportunity to achieve genuine equality, because it will force commissioners to take mental health as seriously as physical health, finally, on the suicide thing. I take a totally different view. Uh, I think um, the fact that, whoever, whichever party it is, the fact that the Deputy Prime Minister of our country talked about suicide in the run-up to an election is the most fantastic breakthrough. It would never, ever have happened. We've made a breakthrough with the public discourse about mental health, but the last taboo, in a way, is about suicide. And to get it out into the open and to discuss it is the first, I think, incredibly important thing. I've been driven in my, uh, 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 in my exploration of this by, first of all, extraordinarily inspiring work in Detroit, where Ed Kofi, a really inspiring leader, uh, challenged the assumption in services that a certain proportion of people will take their own life and said every life, every loss of life is preventable. That had to be the whole principle that everybody signed up to. So this was no target imposed from Whitehall, and this is absolutely not what we're saying. It's about inspiring organisations to think about how they can prevent suicide and regarding every suicide as potentially preventable. And they achieved the most remarkable change, 75% reduction in suicides. They went for over two years without a single suicide in Detroit, a pretty distressed city uh, in the United States. Now we've got the most inspiring leaders in our own country. So Joe Rafferty in Mersey Care leading the way, getting his organisation to think in the same way. Adrian James, uh, an inspiring psychiatrist from Devon, uh, having a whole county approach to achieving an ambition of reducing suicide to zero. Uh, of course we recognise that you don't ever get there, but if you think about the principle of saving every life and looking at what went wrong in every case where someone has taken their life, Fascinatingly, Lewis Appleby, who we've worked very closely on this, who's the leading expert in this country, he says that every suicide he has looked at, and there have been very many over the years, he can see things that could have been done differently that would have reduced the risk. So I think this is a, a really exciting moment. And, and in a sense, the challenge is just to organisations to be ambitious. Uh, to think differently and in a way to challenge the stigma of mental health and to think that a life lost through suicide is just as awful as a life lo lost unnecessarily through cancer. I think it challenges the stigma uh, that you talked about earlier and so I'm incredibly enthusiastic about it. Thank you Norman, thank you panel, thank you everyone in the front row. The rest of the evening belongs to you all here who have given up your time to come here. Uh, this gentleman has been waving his right arm at me for the last three quarters of an hour, so I'm going <laughs> to let this gentleman in first. I'm slightly struggling to see with the, with the people in the top, in, in the balcony from, from with, with the lights. I'm going to take that gentleman first, a lady down the front, yeah. and a gentleman here. Uh, my name is Dave Shepard. Uh, we'll, I'll try and get as many people in as possible. That depends on you all, please, being as succinct as you can, and I won't push every question at all the panel, I'll direct it to the one or two, perhaps two people I think are the most relevant to answer. Sir, I can't hear you, I can't see you exactly with, uh, with the lights, but, but uh, yes, please. I'm a former community health council member, co-opted, and a former forum member of a foundation hospital until I resigned. This was during a Labour administration. And what's your question? My please? question is, Professor Alison Pollock has written a book saying that the NHS no longer exists in England. Dr. John Lister of Health Emergency says we should fight for the NHS in England. Can they both be correct? Ooh, 
A nice, easy one to start with. Okay, I'm actually going to, I'm going to ask all of the panel, given some of the sort of so the. What, is, what did Mr. Lister say? Uh, sorry, you remind us of what John Lister said, please, sir. John Lister vehemently says we should fight for the NHS in England by going on the sort of committee from which I resigned. Thank you. Mm. You see the notice, there. Okay. Then. Yes. Now, before uh, I'm going to give the panel 10 seconds to think about that, can I urge you all again to please uh, load the app for your phone uh, that I mentioned earlier on, that's uh, details on your chair. It's a way of you asking questions and also up, uh, gr grading, essentially, the questions that are, be that, that are being put as well. Uh, there we are. So... Yes. Sorry, could I just urge you all, please, to uh, load the app, use it if you can, uh, use it to submit questions, to rate the questions, the sort of ones you're seeing up here behind us, uh, and then to vote whenever we have a, cu a couple of votes coming up. Uh, okay, I'll take the first one of those in a, in a moment. Uh, Bruce Keogh, I'm going to ask you to kick us off uh, with a, uh, an answer to the point the gentleman raised up there, please. Well, first of all, I simply disagree that the NHS is dead in England. Um, People still get good care, free at the point of delivery, without having to worry about money in the time of most dire well, Mark, need. Mark Porter Bruce says it's, it could break in the next parliament. The system could break. He said that earlier on. That's pretty dramatic stuff. Well, that's what we're having the debate about. So the debate that we're having t tonight is we've recognized that we have significant economic pressures. We have significant clinical pressures born out of increasing demand. And we have to try and marry those two challenges. We have to maintain quality and maintain, if I can use that term, productivity. Um, you know, being able to see people when they need to be seen. And quite frankly, the thing that links those two is the way we innovate and the way we change our current models of care. So, um, firstly, I don't think it is broken. Uh, but I think we can't ignore the pressures which we're under at the moment, both in terms of clinical demand and, f and financial constraint. And secondly, I would utterly agree it's worth fighting for because it is our NHS. It's owned by everybody in this room and everybody outside this room. And we owe it to each other to, um, to help each other. Mark Porter, your organisation, you represent doctors. Will you be campaigning? You are already campaigning, I think, to, to preserve the NHS. What do you, what's your answer to the gentleman upstairs? Uh, the specific question is about what authors write about the NHS, what points they want to get over, and both of the people mentioned by the questioner are committed pro-NHS campaigners who want to make specific points about what's been happening in the last few years, what should happen in the next few. And people always search for ways of expressing that. So one of the authors wants to talk about celebrating a national health service that exists, and if you walk out of here in a few hundred metres, you'll find a national health service hospital with that name on the front. But of course the other author wants to bring to our attention the fact that she thinks thinks the National Health Service is put a, uh, sorry, that sign on the front is but a label in front of an organisation that would no longer be re recognised by the people who set up the NHS in 1948. And both of those descriptions are accurate for the point they're trying to make. So I, I would absolutely resist choosing between the two. But I would say that we should actually look behind those assumptions and say, what is it that we want to keep and what is it we want to take forward? So, for example, one of the original ideas behind the NHS wasn't just free at the point of use. It was also about having integrated public health services that would bring prevention to the heart of the NHS, whereas what we now have is public health services that have been separated from the NHS, put out to local government. That's not necessarily to say abandoned, but they have been disjointed from the NHS. And so those, both of those authors are talking about ways in which we've moved away from the original 1948 ideals that went, just, that went beyond simply a, a service that you actually paid for, sorry, didn't pay for at the point of, uh, at the point of use. But there is one thing that we really need to bring back that was never brought into that 1948 vision. And one thing we absolutely need to do to take ourselves forward, to take this country forward, and that is to integrate social care. That was the one step yeah, that yeah. was never taken yeah. at that time. And yeah. that is the single most important thing we need to get hold of now. Thank you, Mark. Julia, is the NHS dying or in mortal danger, the way the gentleman suggests? No, I don't think it is in mortal danger because you've got 1.5 million people who are absolutely committed to looking after everyone who walks through their door. And you know, whilst we've all touched on the challenges that it faces, I think there are, you know, none of us want to see it disappear. Um, we are having this conversation because we want to work towards finding solutions. It's far too precious to lose, and I think we're far too sensible to let it go. 
Norman, you were very vivid in your opening remarks about the, the, the potential for the NHS to break, as you said. How serious is the situation now? Well, I mean, if you just think about the gap of 30 billion uh, mm. by 2020, and it doesn't suddenly appear in 2020, it mm. grows during the course of the next parliament. So clearly, uh, we can't, uh, you can't just assume that you can carry on as we are. Um, now, we, I argued the case for and secured uh, extra funding through the autumn statement, um, but that's the first stage, uh, but we need to go a lot further. Just picking up on Mark's point, um, the, the secret will be how we bring health and social care together without another structural reorganisation from the top. And the way I argue it is that by 2018, we need to have a complete pooling of budgets locally. Uh, so you have a single health and care budget in a locality uh, and you leave it to the local area to determine whether the local authority leads or the clinical commission group with local authority representation in the commissioning. Single commissioning of a health and care system in a locality. Okay. Thank you. Now, I'm hoping that many of you have loaded the app because we're going to be mindful of the, uh, the question that's oh, still, on the, still on the top there about privatisation of the NHS. I'm going to make the first question, uh, if uh, to improve the NHS, does it need more or less private sector involvement? To improve the NHS, does it need more or less private sector? Hingebrook. Hingebrook will be in many people's minds, I'm sure. It's a, it's a cautionary tale for many people. Uh, so uh, those of you uh, who are able to vote, uh, we'd like to, to see that. Uh, does the NHS need more or less private sector involvement to help it? I didn't hear the question, sorry. Do you think you could discuss privatisation before that? We're having this question as a prelude to, to we're, we're going to see what the audience feel on this as a prelude to answering the question at the top of your screen there behind me. So uh, that will prompt a discussion on privatisation. We will not be running away for it, just bear with us please. Uh, sorry. Why don't we just do a show of hands? We can do if the app is too complicated, but, but the app should make things simpler. Uh, no, maybe it's not. Okay. Are we uh, people in the room who are more technologically able than I, which is pretty much everybody? Can anybody. Uh, We've how to raise our hand. No, 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 no. We still have that skill. Good uh, exercise. J Jason at the back. Are we able to, uh, to get an answer to the, uh, to the question? We have less. That's overwhelming. 88 versus 12. Thank you all for doing that. That's been a, a very useful experiment. We'll use that little format again. OK, for those of you who want to use a show of hands, who thinks there should be more private sector involvement? Show me your hands, please. <laughs> That's why the voting A couple of brave souls up on the balcony there. Yes. We'll, 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 we'll give them a security guard out. Uh, and those with their arms, please, who are against further private sector involvement. That's, uh, that's even more comprehensive than the poll findings behind us. Thank you all very much for old and new fashioned ways of engagement. Uh, Right, we want it. We're going to have a, we triggered by that question and you, your clear feelings here. We're going to have a, uh, a brief discussion on that. Julie Manning, what's your personal views? On this? My personal view is that it's not as clear cut as sometimes the media make it out to be in terms of uh, private versus public. And the reason I say that is as an optician, I owned my own business. I supplied services to the NHS. I invested in my equipment. I was the first digital optometrist in the community using the latest software. I was able to do that because I was able to make that investment and choose to do that. That is very different from a venture capital company investing in an you know, organisation like Hinch and Brook, uh, who are there for their profit, uh, to make profit for their shareholders, to make a, a relatively quick win in terms of making money and then exiting, uh, which they have done uh, sooner than I think anyone expected. So that's why I say it's not quite as clear cut, because I think to lose some of the entrepreneurs who are involved in the smaller businesses that support the NHS, I think we would really lose out. And the other factor to bear in mind is that we did a, uh, a 
a sort of a, an audit of how much of the NHS budget was actually spent in the private sector. And we included in that the amount that is spent on drugs, on GPs, which are also individual businesses, on um, IT support. So all the, and a, a lot of um, services which you might not think are private on, are, or, or think of as being fundamental to the NHS, we found that 28% of the NHS budget was spent on business in one form or another. Without that, the NHS would collapse. So my point is simply it's not quite as clear-cut as some people think, but as for making excessive profits out of the NHS, I think that's iniquitous. Great. Thank you. Norman, uh, <clears throat> evidence from independent, well-respected bodies such as the Nuffield Trust Health Think Tank, as well as campaign groups like Keep Our NHS Public uh, and the NHS Support Federation show that under the four and a half years of the government that you've been uh, a member of for that time, uh, commercial involvement in the uh, NHS has widened and deepened with some, some companies earning contracts uh, worth sometimes half a billion pounds. How do you feel about that, particularly in light of uh, the circle disaster up the road in Cambridgeshire? Well, I think, I, I mean, first of all, my understanding, and I might have gotten this wrong, but I, my understanding is that uh, private providers make up about 6% of the NHS, as it was, and it was 5%. Um, about four years ago, four and a half years ago. The, 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 sorry, uh, this is an important point because this, this statistic that Norman has given us comes up repeatedly in this discussion. Your own Department of Health's annual accounts that came out last year showed that the amount of money in the previous year of the roughly £110 mm. million pound budget mm. that went to non-NHS providers mm. was just over £10 billion for the first time. Some of those have all been charities and third right. sector organisations. And, and just under a further billion pounds of Department of Health money went to non-NHS providers of so non-state mm. providers of social care. Mm. So we're talking 10 or 11 billion pounds going outside okay. the NHS, whether or not it's all to Virgin Care, Circle, etc. Nobody, I think, at the moment knows. Okay. Well, I mean, let me try and give you what my perspective on this is. I have, I have no interest at all in a sort of rush to privatise uh, the NHS or to suddenly think that private providers provide the answer. I don't think that. Um, I, I want us to have a rational debate about this subject. I want us to be also honest at, at what has happened. I think, for example, of the PFI programme under the last government, which uh, mortgaged the future of the NHS in a wholly incompetent way, in my view, to the tune of over £80 billion. Pounds. Now, I don't think that's a good thing. I don't think it's a very good use of money. Over the course of the next Parliament, we'll be spending over £11 billion pounds on PFI contracts, on the payments, the annual payments. That doesn't sound to me like very much uh, sense. My preference... It, and I think we all have a... This is why we have to have this open debate about the NHS. We all have to think about how we achieve uh, better value from the system, given that £30 billion challenge. And I think, actually, the answer lies in the workforce of the NHS. Uh, and I commissioned um, Chris Hamm to do a report on uh, the role of mutualism and social enterprise. Now, um, within community uh, health services, quite a lot of social enterprises have set up non-profit making social enterprise, uh, and their record looks very inc inc encouraging. Uh, is there a role for giving staff of an organisation within the NHS, I'm not talking about organisations leaving the NHS, but I think of foundation trusts. Is there anything brilliant and wonderful about uh, the, the governance and structure of a foundation trust. I don't think so. I don't think they tend to treat their staff particularly well very often. It's very much often, not always, top-down management. My preference is for these organisations to have an option of engaging their staff, of, of enabling their staff to have a stake in the organisation. It doesn't have to be any profit element to it, but the mere fact of having a stake and having a say in the way the organisation is run tends to demonstrate, uh, according to the evidence, uh, improved productivity. So I, I put my faith, in a way, in the staff of this amazing uh, organisation and think that they provide part of the answer, not part of the problem. So that's my preference, rather than uh, fragmenting the system in the way that some people fear would happen if the private sector played a bigger role. Okay. Thank you, Norman. <clears throat> 
Bruce, uh, the, uh, everyone in the NHS <clears throat> and in the political world are set on integration. Many people who argue about privatization say that's the direct enemy it's of integration that is incompatible with it because it will further deepen the fragmentation of the NHS that you talked about in your interview in The Guardian today. Uh, could, would privatization, I'm slightly uh, paraphrasing, or taking a different slant on the question, does it, would, do you agree that it would be uh, unhelpful to indeed the enemy of integration if you have more and more companies profit driven uh, providing more and more service at a time whenever the NHS needs to be a whole more than ever before? I, I need to preface that by saying that discussions on privatization get bogged down by the fact that privatization means something different to everybody. So frankly, opticians, pharmacists, general practitioners are all private practitioners who are contracted into the NHS at one level. So at another level, they share the values of the NHS and they don't use that money for personal gain. They use it for the, for the gain of their organizations and their patients. The issue about privatization, I think, that tends to uh, uh, to inflame discussion is about the, the use of that money for shareholder benefit, if you like. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think there are a few people who uh, necessarily support that. I think in NHS England, I'd like to make it clear that about 6.2% of our budget is spent on, um, on the private sector. An additional 3% is spent on organizations such as social enterprises and charities and what have you. And if you, if you talk about that, then I think they can make a pretty major contribution Absolutely. towards integration. One thing I would also say is that we also have a moral duty to seek the best possible advice on how we run our services and the best intellectual input from, from anywhere. What we're not in the business is selling off assets, if you like, for the, for the purposes of uh, commercial profit. One last thing, setting, setting the question of mutuals aside that Norman Lamb talked about, do you share any, uh, do you have any sort of instinctive uh, anxiety about Circle providing GP service in Cornwall or Virgin Care providing children's service in Devon for example, should people, should those companies be allowed to make profits out of people's health needs? I think that's a really difficult question to answer. <laughs> on, on the basis, on the basis, on the, on the, ba on the basis that um, those people who commission the services will need to make a decision about what alternatives are on offer. And in some cases, that's quite a difficult decision because there isn't a local NHS alternative. But, but, but the central but the question preference is... needs to be for an, an NHS provider. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mark Porter. Thank you. Um, two things I want to say. One is about general practice. The other is about orthopedic surgery. Sorry. Yes. If you were well, in the last response to the question that most people want posed. Bear with me one, one second. Mark is sick. He's quite right, and my apologies. I'll try to be very quick. General practice, um, it, needs, it must be said that most GPs wouldn't say that they're private practitioners. Uh, I would note that because many general practices are contracted to the NHS, the majority are, uh, but how many of you know that it's actually against the law to sell a general practice? It's also against the regulations of the NHS for a GP to control their workload in the way that a private business would. And the fact that you can't sell the business or control its customers means that it's a contracted NHS business, not a private business and we should remember that about general practice. The second thing that needs to be said, and I'll just give an example about uh, privatisation and its potential dangers, because I'm instinctively opposed to the process of privatisation. But actually, I went down this morning to talk to the British Orthopaedic Association, by coincidence, not in preparation for this. And they were telling me about processes that are happening in some of the hospitals that they work in as orthopaedic surgeons, whereby a number of hip and joint replacements, the operations that can be done on a reasonable cost and volume basis, are being taken off by private providers or contracted to private it providers by the local NHS organisations. And yet, of course, the price for the easy and the difficult operations is the same because the tariff pays an average price. And yet the easy operations are being done in the profitable part of the private sector and the difficult operations are being left for the National Health Service, which then cannot recruit its workers. Madam, you've been very vocal. Could you give us a short, sharp question? 
we, we appreciate your attendance tonight. Could you... I'm going to take questions in groups of three from now on because time is against us. I'll take a question from the two ladies over there and then the lady here at the front. First of all, I was absolutely disgusted that you could even talk about the future of the NHS for over an hour without mentioning privatisation. I think it's a major issue for most people. I think that the description that Mark Porter has just given of, of the, the difference between a GP's... Okay. Give, give us a question, please. No, a short, you, short question. Just, just let us talk, please, for a moment. Just for a moment. Uh, Bruce Keir has just said there, quite specifically, that we're not in the business of selling off the assets to the private sector. It is precisely what you are doing. The land is being sold. It is being sold by Propco, the, the NHS property company. It's the, 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 the contracts for the PFI, running the foundation trust hospitals, are precisely selling off our assets into the private sector. And all across the way, everything that you do, I don't know how you can justify talking about the future of the NHS without talking about the fact that you're actually selling it. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Hello, uh, can you hear me? I've never spoken yes, on yes, can, yeah. but my name is Della Reynolds. I'm the coordinator of a pressure group, a PHSO pressure group, uh, asking for reform of the Ombudsman Service. Now, we understand that the NHS Litigation Authority is sitting on a 21 billion payout of litigation costs. And that's often because uh, people who make complaints to the regulatory system are, are not handled properly. Uh, they're forced to go down the legal route. Uh, 21 billion is a lot of money that could go to frontline services. Uh, we'd li I'd like to ask Mr. Lamb, actually, when are we going to have a debate about the role of the regulator, in particular the health service ombudsman? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And the Thank you, Madam. I'm the right. leader on the front. Uh, my name is Radha Karmi, and uh, my main post in my medical career was as a consultant in public health medicine. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry to have to tell you very quickly that in my day, in the 1990s, there was an awful lot of talk about prevention, just very much as it is today. Uh, sadly, uh, very little has happened. Anyway, that's not to discourage anybody. Two points. <laughs> <laughs> Two points. The first to Norman Lamb. Uh, you, you must know uh, that uh, you are an honest, sincere person, I can see that, but you must know that the uh, noble sentiments we've heard from members of the panel for the NHS are an, in, in total opposition to the agenda of the, of the government. <laughs> which we know inclines to uh, 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 changing the NHS out of, of all proportion. Uh, now, particularly the trade transatlantic uh, a trade and investment partnership, uh, which anybody who knows in this audience w will, will realize without being, not being too dramatic will be the end of the NHS. What are you doing? What will your government do to uh, protect the NHS from this treaty. That's a question to you. And and and, and to, Sorry, to, you, to, to Dr. Continue, Porter, please. to Dr. Mark Porter, very quickly. Um, look, a lot of us are, in a way, one of the reasons there is this crisis is because of this Health and Social Care Act, which should never have been passed. Now, my question to Dr. Porter is. Would you uh, have considered, would you agree, that if there had been proper direction from the British Medical Association, which actually mobilized the GPs not to cooperate with the government, if it passed that act, that would have been the death of that act. Would you agree? Thank you, madam. Can you deal with that? Mark, can you please deal with that last question, that last question, briefly, please? Yeah. I'm often asked about the Health and Social Care Act. The BMA opposed it. The BMA opposed it strenuously. The BMA campaigned against it, and the BMA tried to organise a coalition of professional and health-wide organisations to stop it being voted through. At the end of the day, it was the Parliament of the United Kingdom that voted it through over the objections of the people, the profession, and the entire health service. We're not responsible for the Health and Social Care Act. The government that pu pushed it through Parliament is. And I don't think there's anything anybody could have done any stronger. All the campaigners that I saw, all the people that I saw uh, uh, advocating against it, I don't think anybody could have pushed any harder. Look, <laughs> look, 
even, even, the respect, even the respected Guardian, of course, isn't actually the government. But, um, <laughs> I think it is, I think it, since you press that specific point, it is germane to note that while it's legitimate in this country to campaign against a bill, it is illegal to take industrial action against a bill. Mark, thank you. Uh, Norman Lamb, yes or no, would the NHS be better or worse if Andrew Lanzi's bill hadn't got through the House of Commons? Well, I, well... Simple, short answer. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a short answer, and I, I gave it earlier that I think the claims on both sides are exaggerated. I just don't think it has made the difference. And, and just, can I just, can I just, give, hang give, on us a, give us a short answer, please. I please. just want to do, respond to the lady there. Uh, uh, you talk about the agenda that this government is pursuing, and I think about the work I'm doing on mental health and on com constantly driving the case for integrated care. And we've got the Better Care Fund now, which pools £5.3 billion of health and social care funding for 1516. I just don't see that that's the agenda that you feel the government is pursuing. Now, I came in in 2012 after, thank God, after all of that act uh, came, went through. But the agenda that I am pursuing, I feel honestly very proud of. Okay. okay, briefly, the TTIP. The well, uh, my understanding is that the Health Select Committee, cross party, has concluded that it doesn't pose a threat to. Well, uh, I, uh, and, and I understand also that the uh, European Commission has written a letter to the Health Select Committee which confirms that point. Now, that's what I've heard. Uh, I haven't read the report, I haven't seen the letter, but let me. Let me uh, hang on. Let me. Hang on. I, I, as much as anyone in this room, want the NHS protected from TTIP. I just, that is absolutely where I'm at. But just make sure that when you make these claims, that it is going to be a disaster, that you are on firm ground. Because my understanding is that the claim that it destroys the NHS doesn't stand up to analysis. So just... Norman, can, I, can you, in five seconds, give me an answer to my question from a moment ago? Would, if you t let me I think it made little difference. No. Okay. If and, you if you, were, and if you if, look if at... You, if you were a minister now, if the coalition was starting again now, would you, as a minister in the coalition, would you be promoting something like the Health and Social Care Act? At the very least, has that not been an unhelpful uh, distraction from I, the NHS? I have many never challenges? been an enthusiast for the Health and Social Care Act. I've been... I spoke out during the pause, um, but we uh, achieved during the pause the first ever legislative commitment to integrated care, which I think is an important advance. I come back to the fact that the claims that this has in some way completely transformed the NHS is not true. You compare what's happening in England with what's happening in Wales, which didn't go through the reforms, the pressures are exactly the same on both systems. Okay. Just uh, moving on, I'll be with you in a moment, Madam. I haven't forgotten your question. To answer the First Lady's question, uh, Julie Manning, uh, will potentially the circumstances of the NHS face in the next Parliament, the financial, very frightening financial scenario we've heard about, potentially lead the NHS or local NHS organisations to invite more private providers in? And will that be a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, an interesting question because after the next election, uh, I think even more power is going to be devolved to local uh, local councils, local authorities. I think there's going to be more opportunities for people to get involved. In, in other words, uh, the, the electorate to get involved in local decision making, which is, I think is a good thing. It's a democratic thing to do. And it'll be down to all of you to decide who gets involved in providing health care. Hmm. The, the second lady, uh, Madam, could you give us your question again in sort of in, in, in one sentence? Very simple. When are we going to have a parliamentary debate about the role of the health service ombudsman? Uh, the, the role of the health, health service, service ombudsman. ombudsman. Well, I, look, I don't think there's any debate immediately scheduled uh, on the health service ombudsman, but I understand completely the concern that you express. And 
I suppose the way I wanted to respond to your question was to just mention uh, Intermountain Health in Utah, a not-for-profit integrated care organisation that focuses totally on safety, patient safety. And the whole focus of the organisation is on avoiding uh, incidents occurring which result in claims and complaints. And I think, although the NHS has a good record, it needs to go a lot further in absolutely focusing on safety and ensuring that all of the incentives and everyone throughout the system focuses on avoiding harm. And in that way, you can reduce the number of claims that are made against the system. But we have to have a responsive system that deals with people's complaints properly. Thank can you, I just add to that, that when we can see our healthcare records, when we can see what's written in them and what actually happened, then we will have a lot more authority as individuals. I incidentally think the duty of candour, which we've introduced, is a good thing, forcing organisations to be open with patients. Time is on, a friend. We're heading towards the, uh, the end of our time. I want, to take th I want to take three more questions. The gentleman at the back with his paper in the air, the gentleman at the front, and in the interest of fairness, uh, the lady up here to my left at the front, front of the balcony. And everyone, please, for obvious reasons of time, be as brief as you can, please. Sir. Thank you, Chair. Question for Norman Lamb. According to today's Guardian, the Department of Health said that we're providing an extra two billion in funding next year to transform out-of-hospital care. What I would like to ask Norman Lamb is if he can give us a guarantee that until such out-of-hospital care is up and running and has been demonstrated to be superior, there will be a moratorium on any more closures of hospital A&E departments, either in terms of closures or downgradings. Thank you very Thank much. You. A, very, a very pertinent question. The gentleman here with the, with the jumper on this question there. Thank you. Um, the House of Commons Committee on Commissioning uh, reported that the purchase of provider split, which is essential to the market, increased transaction costs from 5% of NHS expenditure to 14%. Now, before we started, there was something saying the 14% included medical secretaries and war clocks and so on, but that's not what the committee found. They found that the market was wasting 14% um, of NHS expenditure, which in today's terms is 15 billion pounds, and if that and the profit made by um, private companies and the, um, the, um, the, the costs of external consultant uh, firms such as PricewaterhouseCooper were uh, no longer uh, uh, used, then uh, I think the uh, financial uh, problems of the NHS would be solved. Okay. Thank you very much. And up at the front of the balcony on my left. Um, I'm a student midwife and I've seen how understaffed it is in all of the maternity wards and it's the only place in healthcare where more than two lives are at risk at one point. So surely, like mental health, money needs to be prioritised properly because there's more lives at risk. Okay, great. Three very good questions, different subjects. Uh, Julia Manning, would you uh, kick us off? This will be the, uh, to already quarter to nine. We have this venue only till around this time, so this, I'm afraid, is going to be uh, our last round of, uh, of answers. Julia, would you mind? Three very different questions there. Uh, moratorium on the, what people would say the rundown of, uh, of hospitals, particularly uh, any units, etc. Uh, the second the gentleman's question there, and the question we've just heard. Uh, the first question, uh, we need transitional funding. Um, and we need more than the two billion that's already been promised because we need to get other services up and running, new models of care, new ways of working, and, and so we require more money to do that, but with a view to then uh, you know, uh, closing down the services which are no longer required because they've been replaced by something better. But until that point, absolutely, you shouldn't, you know, and we can't uh, stop uh, providing services uh, where they're currently provided. The, um, the point about uh, midwifery and, um, you know, two lives being, um, uh, you know, is, is a really important one. The, uh, it come back, comes back to my point that at the moment what's happening is that decisions are being made about what's provided and what isn't provided behind closed doors. We need much greater public involvement in, uh, I, and I think the, the misunderstanding is that people think that 
local decisions are about how services are delivered, not what is delivered. But increasingly, we're seeing postcode lotteries where decisions are made about what is delivered without any public engagement at all. And that absolutely has to change. And I think it can change. And the um, the gentleman's question was... Sort of, will, will, if there was less marketisation of healthcare, less money going to consultants, would there be yeah, more absolutely. money for care? Yeah, I mean, it, um, such a waste of money. Thank you. Mark Porter. I'm conscious of time. I'm going to say just one thing, and I think it's one thing that hasn't come up until that last intervention from the student midwife, and it's about proper staffing levels in the National Health Service. Quality-driven, standards-led levels of staffing that allow us to give the care that patients deserve. I'm not going to name names about the scandals we have heard about recently. There's been more than one. But the unifying factor on them all has been services that have been stripped to the bone using it for, uh, by local decisions with people trying to respond to conflicting pressures pulling in different directions all at once. But the fundamental thing that's lost out is service to patients and in particularly the care and dignity of the patients under our charge at any one time. And we need to make sure we protect that beyond anything else. Bruce Keogh. Um, if it's any help, we've announced in the five-year forward view that we will be undertaking a maternity review. I have to say we're concerned that we have uh, a higher stillbirth rate, for example, in this country than in other parts of Western Europe. We're also concerned that um, it's that we don't always provide the services as close to home as people would like for something which is actually uh, entirely natural. So uh, we'll be announcing that very, very soon. And I think that'll go some way to addressing uh, your midwife issues. The first question is pointed about a potential moratorium on the sort of the rundown of hospitals. Well, I think a lot of people have been very, uh, very keen on that for some time. And from where I sit as medical director, I would want to be absolutely sure before one set of services are shut down that there's actually something at least as good, preferably better, in place. And the last word to the Minister. Norman, could you answer as many of those three points as you can, please? <laughs> First of all, thanks uh, for the choice you've made in terms of career. Um, I think we need to be much better at ensuring that uh, women uh, have choice about uh, the nature, the, the type of birth that they have uh, and where they have it. Uh, I, I'm very keen on a midwife-led service. If you look at the comparison between Holland and our country, it's just completely different. We do a lot of caesarean sections here. They do massive numbers of home births. But for me, it's about choice for the woman uh, herself, about what she wants, and trying to respect that as much as possible, and absolutely ensuring that we invest properly in it, and that we do the workforce planning uh, to ensure that uh, uh, there are sufficient uh, midwives uh, available. On the point uh, uh, from the gentleman at the back, as Bruce says, I mean, these decisions have to be clinically driven. And for me, it's not about transferring necessary services out of hospital. It's about improving our uh, focus on preventive care because I think we all know that there are very many people who end up in hospital where it could have been avoided. And when you think that uh, the proportion of people in hospital, for example, who have dementia, it's about 25%, I think. Uh, uh, large numbers of frail older people where I suspect with a better, stronger uh, general practice and community support integrated with social care, we could have prevented some of those people going into hospital in the first place. That, I think, needs to be the absolute focus. Just picking up one point a woman, the lady made over there about selling off land. I have to say, I would sell off redundant land, absolutely, and use the money to invest in complete digitalization. It's a scandal, surely, that in this day and age we still have faxes flying around the NHS. In every other part of our life, it, we are digitalised, and industries in all sorts of sectors have saved enormous amounts of money through digitalising the way they operate. We've got an enormous opportunity to, make, to achieve better care and, uh, and achieve efficiencies by digitalising the NHS. And to sell off land and to use the resources to achieve that, I think, would be a real big win. Uh, no, Norman Bruce. 
Bruce Key was just, just reminded me that the forward view, I think, mentions that there's £7.3 billion pounds of sort of NHS. Absolutely. And of there, there could be property. Of unused yeah, property. Absolutely. Okay. It's in the a instance, massive resource that could be used to cameras. really good effect to improve care. I may regret this, but Ma Madam, as, as a last contribution of the audience, could you give us... Norman, last word just on the gentleman near the front. Uh, uh, we look, we waste, Le less marketisation, yeah. more money for care for patients. Well, we waste a whole load of money on consultants, certainly, absolutely. Uh, uh, but I, I, I think the, the, the uh, I don't, I'm uh, management consultant. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no, not we like do not guys, waste no. money on uh, clinical consultants. I stress very strongly. Uh, but I, but I, you know, I, I think the challenge of how we secure the financial future of the NHS goes beyond. Uh, what you indicate. Uh, I think it, it, there's an element of that, but I think the challenge is actually much greater and requires, you know, genuinely fresh thinking, which I'm very pleased The Guardian has started to discuss. Well, we've yeah. argued that to, to help fund additional funding for the NHS. I, I, I didn't say purchase advice, I said seek advice. Yeah, yeah. okay. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry, sir, we, we are... The, the, the... Oh, yes. Well, uh, I, I, I don't moratorium. say moratorium because sometimes there are good clinical reasons to reconfigure services. So, stroke services in London, when they were reconfigured by the last government, saved hundreds of lives. So, we must make, always make clinical judgments uh, or base our decisions on clinical judgment. Well... Well, yeah. uh, well, I mean, the, the other side of the coin is that in northwest London, there is some, and I, I visited the hospital in Harrow uh, last week, where there is the most fantastic uh, integrated care uh, pioneering work going on, uh, where they introduced me to the STARS system, where they are stopping people ending up in hospital unnecessarily. So, you know... Uh, we could have a separate discussion about the two A&Es you talk about, but I think there's some very exciting pioneer, pioneering work going on within the NHS in North West London, which I think in future will transform care. OK, folks, we are out of time, I'm afraid. There's plenty more subjects I would like to have uh, had a chance for the panel to talk about and for you all to contribute on. I'm sure you feel the same, but time, uh, I'm afraid, it, uh, has run out. Can I, on behalf of everyone at The Guardian, thank you all for giving up your time and your thoughts and your involvement to come here tonight. And can you all join me, please, in helping thank our panel and our front row health professionals.